Uh, it is so wonderful to be here with all of you uh, today. I was here about seven years ago, and it was far too long. Uh, and I'm just so happy to uh, make uh, your acquaintance again and freshly for those of you I'm meeting for just the first time. So you'll notice that the talk title, Patient-Centered Care for LGBT Individuals, that is a huge topic that I could spend probably half the day speaking on. Uh, and there's always, you have to make a choice with these talks. You have, you know, 45, 50 minutes. Do you just try to hone in on one or two messages or do you give a more kind of broad scope overview and give people some things to think about and maybe look up later a little bit more about on their own. So I am choosing the last of those options. So it's a risk and I hope it isn't too much, uh, but I do want to give you just a taste of some of this. I will be talking just a tiny bit about health disparities, but that is really not at all the focus. The focus is much more about engaging our patients who may or may not be LGBTQ, we don't know yet when we're meeting people for the first time, and being able to set the welcome in the interaction and use the interaction as a foundation for promoting health from thence, uh, from that point forward. And I'm going to be talking about not just the talk part of the interaction, but the physical exam part as well. I do not have any disclosures to tell you about. And we'll be focusing today on the social history and why it's important to include in that some conversation about how a patient views themselves, a conversation about their life experiences and the coping strategies that they use when things get tough. I would like you to exit knowing one question you might think about to ask and delve into each one of these areas. I was asked to briefly review the sexual history, so I'm going to introduce you to a somewhat expanded version of how to do that. The CDC has five Ps, and I would say there are really 10. Of course, you're not gonna remember 10, but we'll see what happens. And then we'll be talking a little bit about performing a pelvic exam as just one uh, example of a particularly vulnerable examination that may bring a lot of things up for certain people and how we can make that a better experience that people are willing uh, to have. I'm going to be framing this conversation around a case that I want you to just think about for a moment. When you first go in to meet this person, you know from the chart that their name is Sabrina Adams, 21 years old. Insurance gender is listed as female. There is some past medical history from the former provider of hepatitis C. And when you look at the person, you see a person who looks like this line drawing here. So a person who is rather petite, who has green eyes, pale skin, freckles, and a short spiky hairdo. So based on all of this, I'd like you to think about your assumptions of the person. First of all, what about the person's sex, gender, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity? How did this person acquire hepatitis C? What do you think they do for work? Okay, so just sort of keep that in your mind, and we'll be coming back to Sabrina Adams uh, a little bit more. So just a quick word about unconscious bias, which we talked about a lot more in the last session on microaggressions. This is a form of bias of which we're not aware. It happens automatically. We make quick assessments. It's really sort of a fight or flight kind of reaction. Put something in a category super quick. If it looks like a tiger coming at you, run. That is the evolutionary reason for doing this. And it's influenced by our backgrounds, experiences, and cultures. So just look here and think about the tabletops. Uh, they're actually the same size. And I didn't believe this either until I traced it out on a piece of paper and imposed one over the other. They don't look the same because of the perspective. And the elephant, how many legs does this elephant have? <laughs> so you can see a couple of pictorial examples of what I'm talking about. But of course, what we do in terms of unconscious bias spans a lot more than that. Today we'll be talking about identity, which from this dictionary definition is the fact of being who or what a person is, a close similarity or affinity with a group. And of course, some identity characteristics are biological ones and other ones are much more defined by an individual's self-concept. And the difficulty with all of this is that when we, when we categorize people according to what we see, i.e. the tone of their skin, for example, if we make a, an assumption uh, based on that about the person, it can lead us to assign identity labels and to completely mess things up. So we need to always ask. We're gonna make these unconscious biases all the time. We can't help it, it's how we're, we're wired. But we need to try to hold that back and ask people, ask them how they see themselves and ask them repeatedly because some identities change over time. 
Then there's this concept of intersectionality that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in 89, who was a black feminist. And essentially, this concept has to do with various biological and social and cultural categories, and you can see them listed here, and others as well, that interact on a lot of different levels simultaneously and contribute to systematic social inequality. So this is at play all the time. It may be that in some situations, one's leading identity is medical educator. Here I am today. In other situations, it might be something that's very different for me. Um, and I might lead with something else, but I still carry all of my identities inside and I may choose to have them more prominent or more quiet and hidden even if I'm worried that they might impact me socially in a negative way. And of course the issue with this is that all of these intersectional identities confer either privilege and power or uh, the opposite of those things. So we can imagine that if you look at that inner I put this pointer to work here. Oops. This circle in here has a lot of characteristics in it um, that many of us have all of these things. And then these are more at the community and societal level, the isms that can go, uh, can be, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, oriented towards these. You know, sexism, cis sexism, etc. And then on the outside is really the macro uh, systems that keep enforcing these old ways of giving people either more privilege or uh, less. So the interesting thing when you consider intersectionality is that you really have to think of it in a balanced way. So uh, since we're collections of various different characteristics, some of those are going to confer privilege and some may not. Uh, so you can see below a few examples. A bisexual Latina in San Diego who experiences sexism and biphobia, but she actually speaks Spanish, and so she can function in communities which are majority Spanish-speaking. And then a black heterosexual man in Mississippi who benefits from patriarchy and male privilege, but he experiences racial discrimination on an hourly basis. So uh, you can get a sense of the collections and how it is that we have leading edges in different situations. So for those of us who have, and we probably all have, some less privileged identities, I would call them stigmatized identities, what happens as a result of that? Well, what can happen is anything from simple social exclusion to overt di discrimination and hate crimes on the other end of the spectrum. And here you just see a pictorial representation of what happens inside our brains and then filters down to affect how we feel inside when we are excluded. So being excluded from a group triggers activity in the same regions of the brain that are associated with physical pain. It literally hurts. Very complicated slide, I will just quickly walk you through. The idea here is that all of these factors, including the age at which adverse childhood experiences and stigma discrimination or trauma occur, the duration of that kind of exposure, how often it's happened, how strongly and terribly it has happened, as well as some genetic and transgenerational genetic components and then various aspects of identity impact the individual and a person may have a bunch of healthy adaptive strategies, which they've learned not all by themselves, but because they've had somewhere some anchoring individuals who cared for them and helped them feel safe, and they can keep going back to that, and they may be able to seek care, engage support from various sources, or on the flip side, uh, the person may engage less healthy adaptive strategies, which are trying to reduce the hurt and the difficulty that they're facing. So they may be any of these kinds of things. And essentially, all of this can change us physiologically and affect long-term health outcomes. So some of these can be very positive. There is enormous resilience in people who have experienced multiple traumas with excellent physical outcomes, physical health outcomes, stress coping, and that will get transmitted to another generation and to people in one's orbit. And then there can also be an increased burden of some of the health disparities that we see in LGBT communities and other communities that experience stigma and discrimination. <clears throat> so this is another way of saying that we, we can respond to stress along a whole continuum. Um, and therefore, we have to really treat each, per each person as an individual here as well, asking about the life stressors and adaptive strategies, and really make a commitment in our interaction with the patients to help people gradually increase their resilience over time. 
Here's a definition of the res resilience from the APA. The process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress, such as family and relationship problems, serious health problems, or workplace and financial stressors. It means bouncing back from difficult experiences. So it's, it's using the difficult experiences with a lot of support around oneself to be able to still feel solid inside and not completely beaten down by the experiences. I would like you to leave today thinking about the clinician-patient relationship as one of such anchoring relationships in people's lives. What we are seeking to do with our patients one-on-one -on -one or group in a team fashion with a patient um, is to set a foundation for development of more and more healthy coping strategies and development of resilience over time. SAMHSA, um, interestingly, in 2014 adopted a whole new way of looking at substance abuse treatment, which had to do with trauma-informed care. And you can see with these little numbered flags, the characteristics associated with this. So safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration, mutuality, empowerment, voice, choice, and an understanding of cultural and historical and gender issues. So I think that we could agree, we could talk about this for a little while, but we don't have time, that these are factors that would help us a lot with many of the inequities that exist in our society today. There is a major paradigm shift involved in all this. In medicine, we've been taught to think about a whole pathological way of categorizing. So what's wrong with you is sort of our approach. What's wrong with you? What is the disease? So really, we're trying to switch that to what happened to you. So when a person comes in who has, is using a lot of maladaptive coping strategies, some of which may not be very pleasant for us to interact with, let's say it's a person who has developed an addiction to opiates, who maybe started using opiates because it dulled the pain that they were experiencing. And I'm not talking necessarily about physical pain. It might be that other kind of pain from exclusion and stigma and discrimination. At one time, that was a coping strategy that that person needed, but it became an addiction. And now it's an issue all on its own. And now the person is lying, and now the person is stealing prescription pads, and now the person is demanding, we think. That's how it comes across to us. And we, don't, we see their name on our list, and we think, I think you're, you're not, you know, not maybe really looking forward to seeing this person today, but it's all just part of the addiction. And if we could switch from the pathological, what's wrong with you, and think about what happened to you, and have that be the source of our interaction with the person, it changes the whole paradigm. <coughs> so the guiding principles of trauma-informed care are here. It's really about attending to the power dynamics, thinking about that paradigm shift, and trying to follow the principles in every single case because we don't know what traumas a person has incurred until we ask. And maybe people won't tell us right away and we have to let that unfold over time. And some people will never disclose. Others may have experienced traumas that have affected their health and they don't necessarily perceive them themselves as traumas. So try to make this a blanket way of, a, of an approach. Asking rather than assuming we've talked about already, but think about the ways in which this can cause harm in a clinical relationship, such as a lesbian identifying woman who doesn't return after she's, she's asked, what do you use for contraception? Big assumption there about her sexual orientation, her sexual behavior. Or here's another one, an 80-year-old gentleman with sarcoma for whom the option of surgery is not even discussed due to his age. I had a patient like this who was actually a very vigorous 80-year-old man and was very willing to undergo a surgery that might have very significant m morbidity in order to walk. Sarcoma was in his femur. And he ended up having the surgery, and he went on walking for five years, and then he succumbed to the disease. So for him, that was a very, a very worthwhile thing to do. So we have to ask about the patient's values as well as identities and not make assumptions. Reactivity is really important. Getting back to how we might view certain patient styles that present um, in a negative way or how patients might anticipate that we're going to do that um, and therefore perceive the way that we're behaving toward them even if we weren't intending to behave in that way or may actually not be behaving in that way. So there are all sorts of assumptions that are going on on both sides. You see these little emojis on the side which are trying to portray certain attitudes that either patients or we might come across as. 
So we see patients like this as demanding, hostile, health rejecting, non-compliant. You see these words, we use them in our charts, but maybe this is someone who has been multiply hurt, even in the medical setting, and they are anticipating it happening again right now. So of course they've got their you know, protective fisticuffs up. Why wouldn't they? That's, that's, that's a, a sort of a normal reaction in a setting which has been abnormal for them multiple times. People may also avoid coming back for preventive health and screening. So it's really all about trying to recognize our own reactivity. If you're feeling a, sort of an impulse, it's a reactivity. And the first thing to do is to look inside and say, whoa, you know, there's something strong going on in there. I must be reacting to something that's happening out here. What's that about? Don't act on it. Take a moment to just pause before you do and you'll be much better off because if you react and we end up getting react, 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 react on both sides, it's just causing much more stress and distance in the room and it's hard to get it back. So this all starts with introductions and in, in, in order to properly recognize, to really see the individual before you, it's not enough as we've seen with that little unconscious bias tabletop uh, example we have to ask. We don't even know how the person wants to be addressed. We talked about Sabrina Adams, woman's name. It says that the insurance gender is female, but we have no idea about how this person identifies their own gender. We have no idea what name the individual would like to use. So how would you like to be addressed? What pronouns do you use? And you have to ask everybody, which makes people very nervous to do this. But Actually, my experience in doing this is that when you ask people, I've actually started because I have an established practice and I see people back now after 15 years, I sometimes ask them these things. And they kind of look at me a little funny and then they say, why, why are you asking me? Oh, wow. I'm so glad you're asking me this. I just saw the show last night about transgender people and it is so important that, that physicians and other health care pers personnel start to do this. So it has really been you know, mostly very positive for me. Setting the stage for a development of a mutually trustful, uh, trusting and respected, respectful relationship by, by inviting feedback from the patient is important as well. And you can say it at the beginning when you meet somebody for the first time and you can end that first vi visit saying, how do you feel this went? Is there anything that didn't get, didn't happen here? Just very quickly. And uh, you know, usually people don't have too much to say, but maybe there's something that they want to add or maybe there's something they were concerned about that was raised about the interaction. It gives them an opener to say so. Moving on to the social history, really giving a preamble about strange questions that you might be asking that people are unfamiliar with is reasonable to do, so you can ask any of the things here. I usually will end with that last one. If you don't feel comfortable answering any of these questions, just let me know and we'll move right on. Fine. Well, I don't really want to answer that one. Okay, so tell me about next question. Contextual questions. If you're going to ask people about their identities, you want to ask how people identify. You don't want to ask, you know, what they are. We were just talking in the last session about uh, microaggression. What are you? It makes the person an object. You know, they're not a thing, they're a human being. And so asking how somebody identifies, and remember these things do change over time, so you can ask them again and again. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this, but I think a couple of words are important about race and ethnicity and also about ability. So commonly conflated are race, which really just has to do with shared genealogy based on geography. Most people are multiracial. People may identify as a certain race, and that's a highly personal thing, and so asking how a person identifies is fine. And ethnicity is a shared culture and a history. Multi many people also identify as multi-ethnic. So I'll come back to the ability thing, but I want to say a little bit just a sort of a SOGI, Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, Terminology 101. So sex assigned at birth has to do with what the genitalia look like and what the chromosomes are. Uh, gender identity is, on the other hand, one's internal sense of gender, and it may be different from sex assigned at birth. There are two terms that are frequently, frequently come up around this. Cisgender means the internal sense aligns with the sex assigned at birth, and transgender, which is very much an umbrella term, most often describes people whose internal sense of gender differs from their sex assigned at birth. Sexual orientation, on the other hand, has to do with attraction or choice of sex partners, 
Some people are attracted to opposite sex or gender individuals and may identify themselves as heterosexual. Those who are attracted to same sex uh, gender or individuals may call themselves lesbian or gay. More than one sex or gender bisexual or pansexual. Many people have no desire and may refer to themselves as asexual. And you have to remember this, again, is a very individual, private sense of identification. So based on what you learn about a person's attractions and behavior, you might assign a particular label. But that might not at all be what they assign to themselves. So it's very important to use the terminology that people themselves use. And then finally, queer is another umbrella term for sexual and gender minorities as a whole who are not uh, heterosexual or cisgender is typically how it's used. Here is just an example of a number of terms that can be used along the gender spectrum. There's a huge variation, um, and you can just quickly scan all of these, and they're evolving all the time. So words people are using today will be different in one year, six months, um, etc. So again, important to ask. Let me just say about this slide, which is uh, rather busy, and I'm not going to go over it in detail, but it is very interesting slide. It's basically trying to make the point that identity and attraction and behavior are distinct concepts, and we conflate them all the time. So think about this, for example. I'll pick a very simple one. So think about a cisgender male. Cisgender male has gender identity, cisgender, may be attracted to or may, may, may think of, of his sexual orientation as heterosexual and be attracted to opposite sex only partners, may be attracted to people who are gender conforming, so they choose manners of dress and ways of acting that are conforming to uh, opposite sex and the way society is, is defining it. But that has nothing to do with, with the behavior at all. This person may be completely celibate and not having sex at all, so it's important to think about that separately as well. Uh, The person themselves may express their gender in a variety of ways. Maybe this is uh, a male who presents as a stereotypic male does in our society, maybe not. And then in terms of behavior, this person, even though they identify as heterosexual, may actually be behaviorally bisexual. So you start to see how it's tremendously complicated, and we only so far talked about a heterosexual cisgender male. Think about it when you start talking about somebody who is a little bit less familiar to some of us and who maybe has a very fluid uh, sense of attraction and sexuality uh, over the years. (coughs) Here are some questions that you might ask. What sex were you assigned at birth? How do you identify your gender? Tell me about your concept of being transgender, whatever the term is the person is using. How do you identify your sexual orientation? What does identifying as gay mean to you? So giving people an opportunity to explain it a little bit more. Just want to say two words about disabilities, even though this isn't really what the talk is about, but I think it's instructive that people with disabilities view the world um, as having barriers in it. And uh, as opposed to, again, this, this sort of paradigm view of something being wrong with me, it's really something's wrong in the world because there are no ramps and I can't get my wheelchair up there. So it's important to avoid language that is judgmental and making it appear that you see the person's life as being confined or tragic or any of these kinds of things. And to ask questions to really determine what kinds of accommodations the person needs um, in order to have good quality of life and to be independent. Now, in terms of asking about minority, minority stress and discrimination, I usually ask these sorts of questions. How comfortable do you feel navigating the world with these identities? Have you ever experienced discrimination or harassment because of any of these? How often do you find yourself concealing these identities? And then, obviously, you don't want to just sit there when people tell you something that is hard to say, so just responding in a, in a human, empathic manner. It's also important to ask about coping strategies. Uh, I like the how do you cope with the fact that life can be unfair, stressful experiences, um, Sometimes it's good to sort of let the person know that you're not going to be judging their use of a not-so-adaptive coping strategy, so something like the second. Sometimes people are really affected by stressful experiences and may feel depressed, anxious, et cetera, et cetera. You know, how often does that happen to you? That sort of a thing. How much support do you have? Finding out where is it coming from, because it may be coming from sources that you might not have thought about that are very robust and really important. This is a lovely one that one of my colleagues introduced me to. What brings you joy? 
What is really hard is that for some people, nothing does. And it's very instructive for the person as well to realize that they can't answer the question and that they want that to change. So let's go back to this individual, um, Sabrina Adams, insurance name, insurance gender female, 21 years, has hepatitis C, and you see what the line drawing looks like. Let me tell you a little bit about this person. When you ask, you learn that the person's preferred name is Shay. Shay uses the pronouns they, them, their, and sees themselves as genderqueer, which they describe as somewhere on the spectrum between male and female. They identify their sexual orientation as pansexual and go on to say that ha that, that has to do with being attracted to people of any sex or gender. And we'll learn a little bit more about that when we learn about Shay's sexual history. Shay has one primary partner and occasionally has sex with other people as well. Shay identifies as mixed race. Mother was Korean. Mother had cirrhosis and died when Shay was young, so big stressor there. Shay was born in San Diego. Primary language is English. There is some Korean um, ability as well. And Shay has no known disabilities. Shay lives in a studio in an urban neighborhood. It has a high crime rate. Shay is enrolled in junior college and works part time as a barista was diagnosed with hepatitis C about a year ago and is feeling tired, but actually does not self-perceive a uh, negative health status. And currently, Shay does not have a spiritual practice. Now, in terms of major sources of stress, if you're going to ask a little bit more about that, this, in terms of st uh, stigma and discrimination, the family was isolated when Shay was young because being sick was considered shameful in their mother's culture. When people today learn that Shay's mother died of cirrhosis, they assume that the mother was alcoholic. When people learn that Shay has hepatitis C, they assume the cause is IV drug use. Several providers have reacted with disgust or shock when Shay has come out as genderqueer and pansexual. In terms of personal safety, we learned about the high crime neighborhood, and Shay was actually mugged recently after working the night shift, fortunately with no physical injuries, but obviously a lot of other things. Uh, currently, Shay does feel safe in all of their relationships. In terms of finances, Shay has been getting too tired to keep working all of the extra shifts, and grades are starting to suffer. And Shay is worried that the safety net insurance they're using will not cover hepatitis C treatment. Sorry to keep reading all this, but I want you to get the full flavor of this individual. So in terms of lifestyle behaviors and coping strategies, Shay is not close to their father or sister. Neither of them gets them or their life. Shay does feel well supported by a strong network of friends in the LGBT community. In terms of interacting with healthcare, Shay tends to avoid doctors because of the past negative experiences, but is regularly screened for sexually transmitted infections at a city health clinic, and that's where that diagnosis of hepatitis C comes from. Currently, Shay uses marijuana most days as a de stressor and drinks two to three alcoholic drinks per week. Shay has never smoked tobacco or used anything else. We'll get back to the sexual behavior. And in terms of body image, which is certainly something that a lot of LGBT people grapple with, Shay follows a vegan diet and purposefully stays thin to maintain an androgynous looking body. And cycling is their major mode of transportation. So a lot of exercise is being had. So let's segue into the sexual history and talk a little bit about that. Talking with patients about sex is something that uh, certainly I was never uh, taught to do in medical school at all. I mean, we, we didn't even learn sexual history taking whatsoever. And it often comes up in conversations with first, second, third year medical students that a lot of folks don't really feel comfortable with that or maybe even wonder why it's important at all. So there are obviously many reasons why it's important. The CDC has a rubric, which I don't know if you're familiar with it here, but it has five Ps that you see on the left. Partners, practices, protection, past history of sexually transmitted infections, and prevention of pregnancy. I would say that to do it really well, this list needs to be expanded into 10 Ps. And I just raised this because I think it may help you remember a couple of them to sort of think, oh, five, maybe there were more, and that will be sort of helpful. Um, some of them have to do with setting the stage, like the permission and the privacy piece. The preferences we've already talked about, and that has to do in part with the pronouns, but it also has to do with when you're going to talk about sex, you have to talk about body parts. And many people don't use the, you know, sort of Latin and Greek body part names that we feel comfortable with in medicine or necessarily colloquialisms for these structures. And so it's good to ask people how they, what words they want to use. 
partner's practices, same stuff in the middle in black. And then physical or sexual abuse, very important to talk about, obviously. And then we never talk about pleasure. Remember that question, what brings you joy? Well, sex is one of the things that can bring people a lot of comfort and joy and ability to connect with another person. And we need to be asking about that. Pleasure. How do we help people have pleasurable sexual relationships? So let's go through these a little bit. Permission. I ask all my patients questions about sex. La, la, la. Because it's important for the following reasons. Is that okay with you? And then this information will be kept confidential like the rest of your records. Just quick. Over with. Preferences. We've talked about it. Except for the body parts piece. What language do you use to describe your body parts? People will tell you. And have you had any gender confirming or affirming surgeries or procedures? It's important that we understand what anatomy is there and what is not in terms of making um, recommendations regarding screenings and things like that. Partners, here are some questions. Are you currently sexually active? Have you ever been? Who are you having sex with? Anyone else? Very important, always ask. People will not list the entire list for you otherwise. So uh, the heterosexual cisgender man who is married to a woman that we talked about, um, this is like a man in my practice who I had asked for years these questions of. Finally one day, because I think I had just asked it 10, 20 different times, he finally felt brave enough to say something, although his practice had been going on for much longer. And he said, oh yes, I've been seeing prostitutes for 20 years. And I'm actually really worried because I haven't always used condoms. And I'm really worried maybe I put my life at risk. What if I had a disease? So, and that was after you know all these years of asking the question. So people will not always disclose right away, but you have to give them multiple options. In the past two months, how many partners have you had sex with? In the past 12 months, you can sort of frame this however you wish. How do your partners identify their gender? And then in terms of practices, it's important to get pretty graphic. Here's where we need to know uh, the, the terms to use for different body parts. What kinds of sexual contact do you have? Penis in frontal pelvic opening. We'll talk a little bit more about the kinds of terms that some trans people might like to use, and they will sound very weird to you, maybe, if you're not familiar with them. But it's important to use the word that the person relates to. Anal, oral, all the different types of activities, and what body part touches what body part. Toys. Are toys touching different parts of the body? They can transmit infection, too. And then, when you're all done, remember, it's sort of anyone else. Do you have any other type of sex? Because there's always something new that people will think about that you have not been um, introduced to yet. What about protection from sexually transmitted infections? What do you do to protect yourself from STIs, sexually transmitted infections, or HIV? Just find out what the person knows about that. How often do you use any of the following forms of potential protection? Um, Do you use them less than 25%, 50%, 75%, 100%? I'll usually give them menu because it shows people that you would be willing to hear but they never use it, or they use it only 25% of the time. Then it opens this, the discussion. You can talk a little bit more about, well, well, in what situations would you choose to, and what situations would you not choose to? How do you decide? And then you can move into more of an educational thing about uh, maybe trying to increase it. You know, what, what would it take to maybe get you to increase your use to 50%? It's a harm reduction approach. Uh, past history of sexually transmitted infections. This is pretty self-evident. Uh, I think we can pretty easily ask those questions. Pregnancy. This is interesting for people who, um, uh, you know, may be getting pregnant in ways that may seem unusual to you. So have you considered having a biological child that you would carry? So imagine asking this of a transgender man who still has his parts. That could be a question that you might ask. Um, If the person is capable of becoming pregnant, either because they have the parts and or they're interacting behaviorally in a way which could result in pregnancy. If not, if no, what are you doing to prevent this? And then you can have a conversation about contraception. Physical or sexual abuse. There are a lot of ways to ask this sort of question that you may be introduced to, but something like, have you ever been coerced or forced into doing something sexual that you felt uncomfortable with, made you feel uncomfortable, didn't want to do, that sort of an idea. And then pleasure. Again, very important. Don't leave it out. This matters to people. How satisfied are you with the quality of your sex life? People often have something to say about that. Do you have any concerns about the quality of your sex life? Do you have any concerns specifically about your libido, your level of physical arousal, your ability to achieve orgasm? You may need to describe a little bit, like, what is that? People don't know arousal. What is that with libido? People don't necessarily know what that is. So let's go back to Shay. 
So Shea um, uses frontal pelvic opening rather than vulva, vagina, whatever else. Partners. Shea identifies as pansexual, by which they mean they're attracted to people of any sex or gender. And currently, Shea is in an open relationship with a cisgender male and also has casual sex with trans females. Practices include mutual oral sex, receptive frontal sex with either penis or sex toys, and occasional receptive anal sex. Super important information. So we're going to be, you know, maybe thinking about risk for sexually transmitted infections here and what are we going to do to protect Shea. Fortunately, Shea uses condoms 100% with any penetration activities, either anal or frontal. Past history of sexually transmitted infections, Shea is very responsible about this and gets tested every six months has been negative. Shea did have chlamydia and herpes in high school and has never had a pap test. So cervical cancer screening is an issue here. Shea is 21, so Shea is eligible for that. Pregnancy. Shea terminated an unintended pregnancy as a teenager. May want to carry a biological child in the future, but is definitely interested in a more effective than condoms way of contraception right now. Shea did experience date rape at age 15. That's how the pregnancy occurred. Currently, they feel safe in all relationships, and pleasure is not an issue for Shea. So, um, segueing again, I want to say that in presentations and in write-ups, it's important to continue to use the same kinds of languaging that one uses in interaction. So, when you're on wards doing a presentation orally, you want to do it in the same kind of manner that you would if you were talking to the patient. The same is true in the, the written workup. So remember this, you want to use the patient's own language, you want to use the, here's a person who identifies as, but all the time you hear 35-year-old uh, gay black male. Okay, so you knew this how? So the person, to even ask that the person identifies as gay, maybe the person divulged that they have, that, you know, it's a male who has sex with other men, for example, and you put gay. Maybe you looked at the person's skin tone and you decided that they were black. Did you ask? So be careful and just put what the person actually identifies in, in if you ask them. Um, separate the person from the behavior, similar. Person who uses IV drugs, it's a person first, very important, not IV drug user, addict. These are very negative, pejorative terms and we need to stay away from those. Value-laden labels, sometimes people you'll hear about a cancer survivor or the victim in an assault sort of a situation or the abuser. Remember that people are a sum of many parts, and although a person may have indeed experienced sexual assault, they may not view themselves as a victim at all. They may not like that word. So it's important to use the person who has experienced, even though it's long and clunky, you'll never get into trouble that way. And then describe measurements objectively. You know, the 35-year-old obese female. You, what's that going to be like on open notes when the woman opens up the chart and looks at that? It's not fun. So you just use, you know, the height is this, the weight is that. And we understand the medical implications and hopefully we're having a good conversation with our patient about that. Okay. How are we doing? Good. So trauma-informed physical exam. Let's talk a little bit about this. Here is a person who is sitting on the dreaded exam table with those stirrup things um, which I, I'm going to encourage you to call something else because we're not women getting up in the horse, in the saddle, right? So I call them foot rests and pull them out. And there have been studies that have shown that, that women, right, other people who use these things, prefer to have them called that as well. So we have to think about this really carefully. We're taking care of patients who uh, have experienced trauma, not just LGBT patients, mind you. All of us have experienced some traumas. And going to the doctor is traumatic. We do bad things to people. We poke them, prod them, we forget to ask permission, we stick things into them, we hurt them, and it's pretty terrible. And so we need to be much more careful about all of this. Any exam and procedure has some potential to be traumatizing. This is interesting. On the left side here, you see an old-fashioned speculum. That is a vaginal speculum that used to be used not that terribly long ago, and look at it. So we've come a long way but even the modern speculum hurts people. So we need to learn to use it really well and use a small one and lubricate it and things like that. In terms of deciding what needs to be done, especially when we're thinking about doing procedures that are unpleasant for people, we really need to use the evidence base because we do a lot of stuff that's not necessary. And examples would be um, routine screening, 
uh, office clinical breast exams. There's actually no evidence to really support that. Um, by manual uh, examination in the public examination for a screening purpose, remember, there is no evidence to support that. Testicular examination, same thing. We still continue to teach this in a lot of places. Patients still may expect it and they may feel very reassured if they just had a bimanual exam and you said, uterus and ovaries feel fine. Well, the fact is that excellent OBGYNs doing exams on female patients who are under general anesthesia and totally relaxed and have, have given them permission for this fail to be able to identify ovarian masses a gigantic portion of the time. So exam under ideal circumstance, totally relaxed patient, can't do it. So it's really been shown that these things are not evidence-based. And then there are some things we really need to do, like uh, vaginal self-swabs for gonorrhea chlamydia as an alternative to doing it during a pelvic examination. Many patients would rather use that long Q-tip and insert it into their own orifice and swab it around a few times in cabinet office as opposed to having their genitalia inspected and feet up in the footrests and the speculum, um, you know, causing discomfort, etc. And the truth is that especially with regard to transgender populations, we lack evidence for a lot of screening. So it means that we need to have a conversation, a dialogue with our patients and talk about what we do and do not know and come to a decision together until we have evidence. I talked to you about the frontal pelvic opening idea and other kinds of terminology. So here's a chart from a study that we did at Fenway um, in the trans male community with a lot of focus groups and came up with this chart that shows the gendered terms, which are the ones that you're most familiar with here, less gendered in the center and then least gendered in the ones that the patients on the whole preferred. So vulva, external pelvic area, outer parts. Parts ends up being a very good word often. Outer folds instead of labia, vagina, genital opening, internal canal, frontal pelvic opening, some people, uterus, ovaries. These are so female identified that some trans guys would rather not use these terms and prefer to something kind of more collective like reproductive organs or internal parts. That's much less gendered. Breasts, chest. Now I'm gonna do a chest exam, is that okay? Okay, I, I, ask, I do that now with everybody. I don't use the word breast anymore um, pretty much unless the patient has raised it. Uh, pap test, better than smear for many people or just cervical cancer screening. Talking about cancer and HPV is the reason for this. It's not a woman, it's not a well woman exam. It's not a women's screening exam. It's a cancer screening exam, make it generic. And then these terms come up sometimes, certainly talking about menses comes up in history but in the procedure, uh, making sure that people have disclosed to the point that you need them to to do an exam, we might say, please, you know, remove your undergarments, your underwear. Uh, that means so many different things to different people. I've had people tell me that, patients tell me they were asked to remove their panties. It doesn't go over big for a trans man. So just be mindful of your language. It really matters, these little words that sort of slip out that may just really not be okay. And then pads, tampons, that comes up in the history if you're worried that somebody's bleeding too much, you're using it as sort of a gauge of the amount. But also people bleed a little bit sometimes after a pelvic exam, after a pap test has been done, and you might wish to give them some absorbent product uh, before they go home. So call it that. It's an absorbent product. It's not a women's tampax, basically. Then there are other terms that come up during the exam. Most of these have come not just from the focus groups, but also observations of trainees who are conducting the exam because we do this in terms of mini CEXs and we, we kind of uh, developed a whole uh, collection of these. So negative connotation terms that have sort of a violent or sexual connotation include things like the blades of the speculum instead of that, bills, or just opening, opening. We're gonna, I'm gonna open the speculum now, okay? To describe the sensation of sample collection, I've heard people use these words, or introducing the speculum, I'm going to come into you now. It's, it's really incredible how, I think it's because it's so uncomfortable to do this pelvic exam, that sometimes these unconscious little things slip out and make it even worse. Um, so just developing some language, I'm going to insert the speculum now. You may feel a little pressure, foot rests. Let your legs drop to either side. And then try not to touch the patient too much during the exam and ask them to move all the way down to the end of the table. I heard this one. Um, please move your bottom down until it touches my hand. No, we don't want to do that. Just move it all the way down to the end. If it's not down far enough, just say a little bit more, please. 
modifications to the exam that make it better for people. Again, from our focus groups, having the patient choose the chaperone. Maybe they want a friend. Maybe they want their partner. Uh, maybe they want to choose a female or a male gender-identified individual to be present. So give them a few options. Positioning, feet on the table, as opposed to on the, in the footrest, some people prefer. Very easy to do the exam that way. Choosing the right speculum, something long and thin or short and thin, like a pediatric size. Do use lubricant. It just needs to not have carbomer, which is a product that can interfere with liquid preps. As long as it does not contain carbomer, it is fine. And you can consider using a little bit of topic, topical lidocaine jelly, just applied right at the vaginal orifice for a couple of minutes before inserting the speculum. It really helps. It's really that area that is the most uncomfortable. And then for cervical sampling in a trans male who's had previous unsatisfactory cytology, we think the testosterone makes it more difficult to get a good sample of cells. Nobody wants to repeat this exam soon. So you really want to make sure you get it the first go you can offer the option of pre-treating with two weeks of intravaginal estrogen. And many, surprisingly, many trans men would rather do that than come back for a repeat procedure. And it will not be systemically absorbed to any great extent or cause any uh, you know, difference physiologically for the person. Here are a bunch of positions for the pelvic exam that come from the textbook on uh, women with disabilities on the pelvic exam portion. And obviously, some of these are not going to be necessarily germane. Sometimes you have to have multiple individuals uh, holding the legs and getting uh, the legs in a reasonable position to be able to do an exam. But there are devices that one can get for one's table in this circumstance. This is the foot on the table position. There could be this triangle position to assistance holding legs in this position or even a side position. So you can be very creative. And I, I find it with, with folks who have disabilities, sometimes you really have to. If you have people who can't abduct their legs at all, you might do a position like this, for example. Interestingly, for the rectal exam, also super interesting, this is from a Brazilian journal of urology, uh, but they actually uh, they surveyed the patients who were getting uh, digital rectal examinations to see which they preferred of these positions. So most people examine the patient like that. Turns out that's the second choice. First choice is on the side like this, maybe after you've been doing an abdominal exam or something like that. So we don't know until we ask the patients what they want us to be doing. Remember that people who've had a history of trauma, it'll come up in the context of the exam potentially. People might start hyperventilating. They might dissociate and not be responding to questions. They might burst into tears. And immediately the thing to do is to stop the exam, uh, get the person out of a compromising position, and use ground, utilize grounding techniques, which means you do a lot of things that usually involve their senses to get them back in the room and into the present, because they may be flashing back into a previous uh, difficult experience. And when they're re-engaged, you want to make sure that they're okay before they leave the office, so that they have a self-care plan when they leave. So getting back to Shay in terms of the physical exam, after the purpose of a PAP was explained, Shay agreed to have a pelvic exam um, and preferred these following terms, vagina, cervix, uterus, anus, made it easy for us. Um, Shay preferred a female provider uh, chaperoned by a female medical assistant, very doable, a small speculum with the lubricant, feet on the table, and uh, they said, go slowly, explain everything that you're doing as you go along. Some people will say, just get it over with and don't talk to me at all. Um, so it really depends. And then the exam was halted immediately when the speculum pinched a little bit, and Shay was okay about continuing on. And at the end, was glad to get it over with, but said, actually, it wasn't that bad. So that was a great outcome. So just lastly, as we're running short on time, I wanted to talk about resilience promotion uh, with, with patients. So obviously, one of the first things that is going to help establish a groundwork for resilience is safety in the room, in the relationship, which means that you're really working together all the time you're giving affirmation and support to the individual. You're asking them for feedback all the time and their, their own ideas about their care, which means that they'll be much more actively participating in it themselves. You will find as you work with individuals over time that what will happen as you know, certainly part of resilience is helping them connect with community as well, finding supports, but you'll also find that as people become more involved in the community, often, they will rise to leadership positions in the community in some way, shape, or form, help other people along and give other folks a, an anchor, and may end up actually doing advocacy and service in their communities as well. And we need to do all these things. There's an interesting term um, that uh, the IHI 
uh, came up with, which is called upstreamist. You hear about hospitalists and intensivists and this and that. This is upstreamist. So what is that? It's sort of this inspirational idea that social determinants of health cause most of the health problems that we see in our primary care offices. And often as mere individuals sitting with a patient who has experienced their own set of social determinants of health, we feel very helpless because we can't do anything about poverty. We can't do anything about the violence in their community. We can't do anything about the fact that cops single them out to be brought, you know, pulled over and given a ticket to just because of their skin tone, etc. So we can feel very helpless and give up on this. Or we can band together with other people in our medical community and we can think about how together we can try to affect those more systemic forces that are causing harm to our patients. Okay, so that might have to do with trying to work toward marriage equality, or it might be trying to get the community a garden or a safe watch neighborhood program so people can actually walk in the evening when they get out of work and get a little bit of exercise. There are all sorts of things uh, that we can do as well. This is my last slide. So this is what is happening with Shay uh, now. Following a discussion of various options to prevent pregnancy, Shay opted to get a progestin IUD as a dual contraceptive and for the menstrual benefit. So Shay was not thrilled about having menstrual flow and this got rid of it, as it turned out. Shay returned for regular follow-up, which included an HPV vaccine series and seeing a GI consultant whose office is now working on a plan to cover hepatitis C treatment. After reviewing a list of LGBT resources that the office had offered to Shay, Shay applied for and received a scholarship from the Point Foundation, which gives monies to LGBTQ individuals for educational purposes. And this enabled them to cut back on work hours and devote more time to studying, connected them with a peer group that they met with regularly, composed of other awardees, and appointed an educational mentor. Less stressed overall, Shay began to have more energy started using marijuana far less often and their grades improved. Yeah, exactly. So that is the last <coughs> message that I'm going to leave you with. I'm taking questions if you have some. Thanks. Questions?